Hello, everybody, and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. It's wonderful to have you with us. It's a pretty chilly day, minus five, minus six, but as you can see behind me, it's uh, quite sunny, a few clouds around in the other direction, sort of over there, but a really lovely, lovely day to be in the Arctic. Of course, we arrived a few days ago on this little Luft transport plane flying over the amazing mountains of Svalbard. And it's very, very sad that we are, in fact, in lockdown uh, in the UK. So the Arctic's in lockdown, we're in lockdown. And so welcome to a virtual Axe at Arctic Live. My name's Jamie from Encounter EDU, and I'll be your host over the next two weeks as we explore life and science in the frozen north. Now, we've got a great, great session today. We've got the wonderful explorer, filmmaker, and scientist, Ellie Mackay. Hi, Ellie. We'll come, we're looking forward to speaking in just a bit. Um, so many brilliant questions that have been submitted. Uh, but before we get to that, a little bit of a format of the live lessons. So we've got some shout outs to give. We've got tons of great pre-submitted questions. Uh, and we're looking forward to getting through some of those. And of course, we've got the live chat and the live chat over here. Do make sure, because it's social media, yeah, if you're younger, sort of under 13, you've got a parent or a teacher who's doing that for you, who's got, who's got the YouTube live chat up. And as a point of digital housekeeping, really, just to make sure that if you are posting things in the live chat, we love to see shout outs. We love to hear comments on what we're talking about. And we love your great, great questions. But please do try to keep it to that and don't go off on a on chat with your, your mates or your friends um, or any off-topic off comments. Really great to keep that going. Um, so we've got some shout outs. We've got the quite pre-submitted questions and then we'll take questions from the live chat over here. Uh, so I'm just going to see who we've got um, joining us today. We have uh, students and schools joining us from the USA, the UK, Canada, Ireland, Ecuador, and France. So welcome, one and all. And we've got some special shout outs too. Hey, we've got uh, Lawrence Intermediate School, uh, Mr. Brennan's class. I think they've been joining us in the Arctic since this began quite a few years ago. So big shout out to Lawrence Intermediate School in Lawrence, New Jersey. So hi to all the students watching from there. Um, we've got Carrie Kelly from Inspire, and I've got a quite cryptic message. Maybe Ellie can help with this. Thanks, Ellie. We hope you stay warm. Q and Sloan. So um, there we are. So we'll we'll work out how that works. Uh, we've got Denise Ahmed, who's home educating, and this is a uh, uh, Zakaria uh, Yaya Issa and Mariam. Keep up the good work. Amazing. Keeping up the good work um, at this time. We've got a big uh, Garden House School shout out, and that's from Lynn Kingling, and that's to Josie and Jasper. Hi, guys. Lovely to have you in our virtual Arctic as well. Um, hi from Ernie and Chepstow. Um, we have the Collegio uh, Gutenberg Schuler uh, uh, in Ecuador joining us. Amazing to have you with us. So, hi to all the students there. Union Point Academy. Uh, coming in from Kentucky in the USA, and a big hello from English Plus in Montpellier, and that is the Lycée La Merci. So wonderful to have you all joining. And I think, Ellie, you had some shout outs. Was that right? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you so much. So I have shout outs for Jago, Milo and Jazzy, who are watching with Grandma Kay. They're watching from Greyshot. Hi to you guys. I think that Jago wants to be a scientist. So fantastic work, Jago. Hopefully you'll find today's session really useful. Um, shout out to Grandpa Dave, who's who's watching with granddaughter Evie. Hi to you guys. I think you're in Woking. So um, thanks for joining us. And also, as always, a big thank you and uh, hello to Oscar in Anglesey, who I think has joined us for every session so far. Hi again. Good to have you back, Oscar. Wonderful. Thanks, Ellie. Now, I've been looking at these live questions, and there are a lot of young people across this country, and it seems internationally, who quite want your job. Now, before we get into this, uh, 
what exactly is your role in, in the Arctic? Because we're up here, we're on a combined um, sort of science education uh, expedition. We're in a virtual Neolison where we normally come, this small science community. Um, and we, we, we we're doing these two things. We're researching the ocean and we are doing this education outreach. How do you fit in to this whole piece? Absolutely. It's a fantastic question. I normally describe my role as a live field producer or a live broadcaster. Um, so that means that I'm responsible for bringing the stories of all of that science and the research that we're doing up here, um, communicating that to you guys and bringing it to life and bringing it into your, I would say, classrooms, but potentially even your homes at the moment. Um, and that's more important than ever during lockdown to be able to bring a sense of another world, somewhere remote, somewhere unusual that you've never been. Um, and particularly up here, because actually um, the general public can't come this far north to this world's northernmost research station. And so what I do is I build the world's northernmost production studio up here. And we have uh, a lot of broadcasting, which means live lessons and bringing those to you. So I'm just going to show you some photos of the sorts of things that we do behind the scenes. My role is to make sure that all of the video feeds, all of the audio, all of the cameras, all of the internet connections, everything that's required to bring a live lesson from a remote environment like a coral reef or the Arctic um, to you without any issues. And obviously that means sometimes filming in a blizzard or it means sometimes dealing with not very good connectivity. So I sort of have to troubleshoot. I have lots of cables. I press lots of buttons. I make sure that the scientists uh, look great and are comfortable on screen. And then we press play, we press broadcast, we go live out to you guys as we are today. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about what I do. And Ellie, uh, you know, we've, we've got all these questions, but, but where where are we? exactly virtually i mean i know you're i'm i'm at an airstrip um on Svalbard, and you're 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 standing at the back of the station yeah so this uh view behind me is the view from the um NERC arctic research station which is the uk arctic research station so in neolisund which is a research scientific village uh each country has their own kind of research station. And I think the UK research station has got the best view because we can see this beautiful fjord behind us with the glacier coming down from the, the in the distance. And then we can see this, this lovely sea ice. And quite often you can see these sort of footprint tracks um, that's maybe been from a reindeer or an Arctic fox um, that comes through the night when it's quiet. So I can show you uh, some some drone footage to show you the size of the village itself. Let me just show you this. Now, this is an aerial uh, image of Neolisund. This is the research center. And as you can see, it's only about 30 buildings. A lot of those are power stations and storage facilities, as well as where we keep our scientific uh, research material. Um, and that's where researchers spend several months at a time, potentially, um, gathering their information from the nearby um, area. Brilliant. And, I, and I've got a globe just here, Ellie, and I can yep. just, I think, point out where, it, where, where we're talking about, my massive globe here. Um, and if I just bring it closer, we can see a few, a few places. We can see, uh, I think that's the UK, uh, and then Norway, and then we are up here on Svalbard. So you can see sort of halfway between Norway and the North Pole, level with the top of Greenland there, Iceland here, uh, we've got France and then Africa down here with, uh, this is the Canada, I think, over here. Very hard to, to, to look in a, there we go. So we are on Svalbard, this island sort of halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. Do we want to show everybody what the current weather is on Neolison right now? I, I, I think I think it would just we would be in just finishing our work 
I mean, we'll be doing this now. Um, so what would the weather be like out of the window right now if we were in the Arctic Alley? So I'm just going to show you because we have a camera that we can go to. There we go. And this camera, I can refresh and this will show us uh, our last updated one minute ago. And if I press play, we can watch the weather from the last 24 hours and you'll be able to see the sea ice coming in there. You can see it's thick snow and ice. And there goes the sun that goes, funnily enough, across the sky instead of up and down. I'm just going to let that play through again and you'll see, wait for the sun to come across instead of up and down. And that's a really odd sort of phenomenon. And that is, of course, because at the moment in the Arctic, it's 24 hours of daylight. So the sun just goes round in a circle instead of coming up and going down. Amazing. So uh, is the sun at the moment it's sort of to the, I want to say the sort of south, southwest? South, yeah, southwesterly at the moment, yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's quite odd because you can tell the time of day. It's like being in, in a sort of giant sundial. You can tell the time of day by sort of like where, where the sun is sort of go, going around the Olesund. It's like you're the center of the clock. And then the, the sun goes around one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. So you can sort of like being inside a giant natural clock. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in. We've got about 30 pre-submitted questions. Um, and then we've got some great ones coming through on the live chat too. So I might have to sort of rattle through a few of them. This is from uh, Lynn Kinglin and the Garden House School. Do you need a permit to do research? Um, up in the Olesund? That is a really good question. Uh, yes, you do. So the general public can't come here. You have to submit a scientific research permit. And it has to be approved by lots of different people, like the scientific research base and the Norwegian government as well. Um, and you need to put in lots of information about what equipment you're going to be bringing because it's all quite strictly controlled. So yes, there's a lot of paperwork to get up here. <laughs> Deep, deep joy of paperwork. Um, and, and then a, a follow up question that again from Garden House School is, is, is do all countries research in, in the same location? Um, and and how, how do you choose where, where to put your base or where to do your research in the Arctic? Another great question. So as you saw from that aerial footage, the, all of the research stations from each country um, are all in the same village in Neolison, so they're all close together. But the individual scientists might be doing their research a bit further afield. So they might take a skidoo, um, which is like a little sort of quad bike on skis. Um, they might take that um, further away and maybe even take a tent with them and camp um, for a few days further afield. Um, we do a lot of research with um, ocean sampling, sampling in the fjord for water. Um, and so we'll take the boat out and do our sampling out in the boat. So the, the choice of location depends on what you're studying. If you're looking at ice, if you're looking at land, if you're looking at animals, if you're looking in the ocean. Um, but that tends to be where the Neolison base is a kind of center where everybody stays and where everybody's equipment is. And then they might go out to different sites around that. And then I suppose uh, other there are other Arctic research stations out there. There's sort of there's there's the um, Nord, Nord uh, station Nord on, on Greenland is quite a famous one. There's um, the new Canadian base at, at Cambridge Bay. Um, there's I don't know whether there's more than a weather station at Alert. Um, and but there's other 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 stations out there as as well as sort of boat based research. So we've got the Mosaic project at the moment with the polar stern so i mean as ellie was saying i think you know you as you were saying ellie, that you know that we we have all these different research bases depending on logistics i imagine and on and on the science you want to do absolutely the the mosaic project is for example a really fun one to um to look up and perhaps your teachers and parents can help you google it uh where they have driven a boat into the ice sheets and then they're frozen into the ice and they're allowing the ice which drifts over the North Pole to carry the boat. Um, so it's going to be locked in ice for I think it's two years and the scientists on there are then studying all sorts of information about that moving ice sheet. So yeah, the, the location that you choose um, and it's all around from, from Alaskan Arctic, the Greenlandic Arctic, the Norwegian Arctic and the Russian Arctic 
um, all have these these sort of scientific bases and we're very lucky to be able to broadcast normally on location but even remotely um, from the Neolocent one. Brilliant. Um, a question um, from Alejandro uh, Espinoza um, in Ecuador. Um, how, how, how do you feel about observing um, how closely how, how Svalbard is melting, how there's a reduction in, in, in glacial cover, for instance? It's tough. It's really hard to see. And especially when we go there ourselves, personally, um, you're seeing it firsthand. And it is very tough, even in the last few years, from first uh, first visits to the Arctic, where everything was quite frozen and the sea ice was probably just about thick enough to walk on. Um, and just in a matter of years, we've now seen a loss of that sea ice so that it's definitely not thick enough to walk on anymore and you would fall through, which means things like polar bears can't use it to hunt. Um, and then even just the ground being able to, um, the, the, the melt being um, much more apparent. So behind me, you can see where there's sort of solid uh, ice cover and snow cover. And actually, even at this time of year, we're starting to see grass coming through. We're starting to see mud visible. Um, so it means there's less place for some of the animals here to bury their food. And there's all sorts of shifts happening. It's, it's very tough to see it in real life, to recognize to see the direct impacts of our lives back home, to come somewhere like this that's so beautiful and remote and see the impact of human activity. Um, and yet I'd say it's still very, I still feel very hopeful because the research that's going on here is so informative and so helpful in helping us map out those patterns of change. And we can then bring that back home and say, look at what's happening. This is the evidence. This, these are the reasons why we need to change and why you know policies need to be adjusted and why everybody can play their part. So it's sad to see, but it's also it's also hopeful to see as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. Thank you, Ellie, for that. I mean, it, it's it's those those twin things of of, of sadness and hope um, that that I imagine drive drive you and, and a lot of the work. That, that you do. Um, moving on, it's a slightly different tag, but this is a question from Lise Lamassi, and maybe you can you can sort of inform it with, with that sort of environmental communication piece. Is, is the question is actually, in your opinion, where is the best place to take pictures? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, again, it depends, just like where's the best place to study science, it depends what kind of scientific question you're asking and what kind of answers you want. I would say it's the same with taking pictures as a bit of a science as well, because it depends what story you want to tell. If you just want to show the most beautiful places in the earth, uh, on the earth, then you need to go to the most beautiful places on, on earth. And I've certainly been lucky enough as an explorer in my life to see some really stunning jungles and volcanoes and mountains and of course, the beautiful Arctic. Um, if you're trying to bring a message across with those photos, like the environmental impacts that human activity is causing, then you do need to go to some less beautiful places um, and potentially try and show some of those impacts. And sometimes those are difficult photos to take. They're difficult videos to film as well. And part of my job as a filmmaker and communicator is telling those stories in a way that doesn't make us feel disgusted and angry and hurt and feel helpless, but to show those parts of the world in a way that still gives us action and hope and a positive sort of um, important feeling about that our, our actions are um, powerful and do have impact. So I would say the best places to photograph are places that are changing. Um, and that might even be your garden. You might notice that, you know, the weather is changing in your back garden, in which case, why not document it and see if there's a story there? That's a very, very good point that we don't have necessarily have to go to the ends of the earth to tell these stories, that 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 narrative, that story of environmental change can be found near where we are. And, and an important message during lockdown as well, where we, we start to observe the changes happening much closer to us. Uh, sort of move, moving on, really, there's a whole sort of range of questions looking at working in the Arctic. Um, and I'm going to start start off with sort of like a segue from, from where you are, but what, what's the most exciting thing that you have filmed while you've been up north? And that's from uh, Carrie Kelly. 
Oh, that's a hard one. Um, so many things. Uh, seeing um, whales is always really good. Any, any kind of wildlife is fun. Anytime you see um, reindeer, we saw baby reindeer, arctic foxes, whales, beluga whales, minke whales. Um, but actually, I have to say, probably the most exciting thing I filmed is the view from the little tiny plane um, as you come in to this research site, um, which you can see behind Jamie, that little tiny plane. Um, and it's because you get a real sense of scale of the glacier that comes down. Um, it's huge, um, sort of acres and acres and acres of these crevices and cracks. Um, it's absolutely stunning and it really makes you feel like you're sort of on top of the world on the northernmost port, point of the world. And you can see um, nothing for as far as the eye can see. And it's really quite spectacular. That's kind of fun. Yeah, it's just a 25 minute flight, but it's 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 the best flight in the world. Best flight in the world is from from Long uh the the main town on Svalbard up to the to the research community at Neolosund. Um I I can't get enough of it and hopefully uh we'll be up maybe next year, maybe next the next season. Uh so what um what amazes you most about the Arctic Ellie? And that is from, ooh, where are we? Here we are. Um, and that is from Sasha um, Nicolades, and that's from Chepstow. Hello, Sasha. Um, what amazes me most? I'd say the light and the sound. Um, because you might think that the Arctic is somewhere that is white and silent. Uh, and it does feel that way when you first step off the plane and it's a bit bright and everything's you haven't quite got your um your arctic eyes sorted out yet you have to wear quite polarized dark goggles because otherwise it is a bit blinding white um and it is very quiet because there's no city and there's no traffic and beeping and shouting and none of that noise that we're used to um but then after a few days you start to see all these beautiful pinks and greys and purples and blues in the ice and you realize it's a really colorful place and you start to hear the cracks and the creaks and the bubbles and squeaks and pops in the ice and you start to hear the sort of maybe a little howl or some birds in the distance and it really makes you focus on the the light and sound that in a city or in back home you just walk through an area and you don't really pay attention to that but this makes you in the Arctic, you're, you're forced to be still and be slower and to notice. And then you realize you're almost immersed in this incredibly colorful and sound rich environment. And it's it's like discovering a whole new world, which is really exciting. Amazing. Sounds absolutely amazing. You, I'll have to go there one day. No. Um, so uh, we've got a few questions just, just on logistics. Um, we've got from Lynn and Garden House School, the months that people researched in the Arctic. And then we've got um, a follow up um, from Sasha as well saying, uh, how long um, are your way for? So, so the timing during the year and then the length, Ellie, in terms of Arctic explorations. OK, so the uh, the timing in terms of the length, it again depends on what you're studying. If it's something that you can go um, for just a couple of weeks and collect some samples and then take them back home and analyze them, then you only need to come for two or three weeks. Um, if you're studying something that you need to look at data, maybe you need to collect it every week for six months, then you might actually need to come up here for six months. Um, normally, you would have a bit of a break. You might come for a few months at a time. Um, it's very unusual to stay the whole year here. Some people do, but it's quite tough. Um, the, the Arctic research team that we come up with, we only need to collect a few samples. We come up for two to three weeks at a time to collect those samples. And then a lot of the analysis is done back down in the lab. In terms of when in the year to come, we could go back to our weather window and I could show you the 24 hours we could change to 12 months and I can show you this view, which is the last 12 months. You've got six months of full sunshine. And there you see you don't even have any snow. Um, so you've got quite visible land and it's a bit warmer. And then you get into the snow comes in and then suddenly you get six months of continual darkness 
thick snow and pitch black for six months at a time. So that's going to be pretty intense and pretty stressful. So again, if you're studying ice, then you can't go in the summer when there isn't any ice. Um, but you probably don't want to be there for the whole winter because it'd be pitch black for six months. It'd be pretty miserable and quite tough environment to work in. So normally you go sort of um, springtime or, or, or um, autumn time, spring or fall. Uh, so May, for example, now is a perfect time, and that's why that's when we come. Brilliant! Um, it's, it sounds like it's you know it's it's just an amazing place, and it, it behaves very differently from the rest of the world with these sort of long periods of light and long periods of darkness. Uh, but Ellie, I mentioned at the beginning that there are people after your job, uh, so. <laughs> Um, we've got a range of questions connected to becoming you, um, becoming you, doing your your job. So, so um, I'm going to start off uh, with a question from Union Point Academy um, from Gina Ramage, and it's a, and it's Ellie. You teach us live. You're behind the camera. You produce. You do everything. We have enjoyed watching you in front of and behind the camera. Thank you. But what is your favourite? Oh. You're asking so many hard questions today, guys. Um, yes, I do a bit of everything. I produce, I film, um, I am in charge of all the equipment, so I have to pack equipment like this. Um, I really do love being behind the scenes because I'm a bit of a tech geek and I love getting cameras uh, and technology all to work. I like setting everything up. I love troubleshooting as well. So when things go wrong and my heart's racing because I'm trying to stay connected. So I do actually really love um, that element. However, chatting to you guys as I'm doing now um, in the studio, presenting, uh, telling those stories, um, showing, uh, telling stories about my experiences is really fun as well because it means I get to kind of talk to you a bit more directly and hear from great, great questions from you. So I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that because I like everything. I like doing it all. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a cop out answer. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll let that off, but you do have to answer the next question which is a follow-up question from that, which is, how do you feel uh, to know that your work inspires students like us? And that's from uh, Colegio Gutenberg Schuler in Ecuador. Oh, that's such a lovely question. Thank you so much. Um, it is very humbling. Uh, I take it as a very, very big responsibility. I've always felt when I've been teaching in classrooms or giving talks on stage, I know that there are people listening who may really take what I say to heart and they might maybe change their behavior. They might switch to using, um, you know, plastic free water bottle or toothbrush, for example, little steps. Some of them also, I've had emails from people who've changed their degree or they're studying science because I, I taught them science and they had fun. And that is really, really amazing for me. It's very inspiring for me. And what's exciting is that I get to then see all the amazing work that those students do as a result. So for me, I find it very humbling. I take it quite seriously. Um, I love it very much and it's really kind to hear. Um, I just try, this is all I know. I do my best to share my stories and if that can inspire somebody else, then brilliant. You're doing brilliantly, Ellie. Keep it up. Keep it up. Um, but there's some lovely questions here and, and following on from, from you know, studying. Um, and, and the question is, is from uh, Lise, uh, Lise, sorry, La Merci, I think that's it, in, in Marseille. And it was asking about what kind of studies do you need to do the work of a scientific explorer like yourself? Yeah, another really good question. So a scientific research expedition is made up of a whole team. It's not just the lead scientist. Um, and so there will be several scientists um, in the expedition team and they might have different specialties. So I might be on a research project with someone who's a biologist, someone who's a chemist, maybe a water chemistry specialist. Somebody else might even be a physicist or a geographer um, and they will all work together. So any kind of science that you study could be useful for being um, a, a science explorer or research expedition scientist. Um, so definitely if you're interested in science and study all the science you can, study your favorite sciences, whether that's animal biology or plant biology or weather or physics or environmental systems, um, study anything that 
you're passionate about and there will be a place on an expedition for you somewhere but even if you're not into sciences then there's lots of positions available on an expedition for chefs, for mechanics, for crew, for assistants, um, for captains of the boat, for example, navigators, um, really, really key roles that the scientists can't do the expedition without. So if you're more interested in navigation or you're more interested in learning how to um, fly a plane or drive a boat, then there would be a place for you as well. So I would say if you're interested in exploring and go on an expedition, then study things that you're interested in, study things that you're passionate about, um, and then see where that takes you in the world. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Ellie. Um, we've just got um, just two, I mean, this lovely pair of questions. Um, this is from from Sasha and Chepstow and, and this follow up um, from 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 the students in Marseille um, is is why did you choose this career slash when you were little, did you want to explore the Arctic? Really good questions. Why did I choose this career? Um, because it combines uh, not only things that I love, but things that I'm good at as well. So I'm very lucky to be passionate about things and have had the chance to study um, and refine my skills. So that's scientific research and finding out answers and being curious and studying things in the natural world. Um, storytelling and communication. So making that science understandable, making it exciting, making it interesting and relevant. Um, and then also the technical side of being a bit creative with film and video and audio and making podcasts and making films. So I'm somebody that likes to tell stories using videos and audio about science. So all of it fits together really well with this particular job. Um, when I was little, I didn't know that I wanted to be an Arctic uh, scientist or an Arctic explorer. I definitely knew I wanted to travel the world and I traveled the world as much as I could and I always wanted to go to new places. I think that's the sort of scientific curiosity um, element there. I've always been interested in meeting new people and seeing new cultures always been fascinated by the Arctic. So for me, it's a real dream come true to be able to study here, to be able to tell the stories of the scientists that are doing their research here. Um, so it wasn't something that I have always sort of said, that's my goal, but it's something I'm really, really happy and really proud to be part of. I mean, it, it's amazing what you do, Ellie. And, and I mean, this is from, from um, Lawrence in, in New Jersey, we've got a, just a few questions. The first of which is, is how, how do you become a filmmaker? What if, if you say, I want to be a filmmaker, what, what's the first thing you should do? So it's a silly answer, but the first thing you should do is start making films. Uh, and that, by that, I mean, you don't need to go and get a qualification first. The very first thing you should do is ask if you can borrow a parent or a teacher's smartphone or a, a basic camera and start filming things, start documenting anything you can see. And it might be that you're telling a story of um, digging around in the garden looking for earthworms, or you might be uh, trying to document just the wildlife out of the window that you can see, especially now in lockdown, you might have to be quite close to home uh, trying to find those stories. But start filming and then start looking back at that footage and saying, what story does it tell? And how can you make it tell a different story or better story? And the other thing, and this is really fun homework, is to watch lots of films, watch documentaries and read books and find out information that you that think is interesting um, and talk to friends, talk to neighbors, talk to um, people that you you know your teachers and find out what they're interested in and there might be a really fascinating story there that you think wow that's so cool how can i tell that um with a video with a little animation perhaps or um you know a, an interview with somebody so get out there and start making things um, and show family and friends and ask for feedback if then you love it and you do find it interesting you want to be a professional filmmaker you can then study filmmaking uh, directing, producing, cameras, sound, lighting, all of it. You can study that at university or you can study it on something called a BTEC course. There's lots of different local and national in the US. There's different courses available that you can study. It gives you a bit of a certificate, but it also means that you get lots of practice. And then you can apply for like an internship 
at a production studio where you become a camera assistant and you sort of work your way up. But the first thing I'd say is get out there and start shooting and start telling stories, especially now with smartphones and YouTube. You know, you can you can do it yourself um, quite easily and you don't need lots of money and lots of special equipment to do that. So get out there and have a try. Brilliant. That's amazing advice, Ellie. Just 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 go go and do it. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in on, on, on the live chat, um, but we've got, uh, can I give you a quick fire round? So I'm going to, 10, 10 words max. Are you ready? Uh, this is from uh, Marseille. What is the scariest thing that has happened to you? Um, cave full of spiders or world's deepest cave scuba dive. So cavey then. Um, so, Don't like from, from Rishma from Dover College, do you miss your family when you're far away from them? Yes, of course. Um, you you miss them a lot. You think about them a lot, and if you can send a message, you do. Um, but it's really fun getting back and sharing stories and and uh, images and photos. Brilliant. Uh, Scarlet at Dover, do you ever touch the animals in the Arctic? No, big no, no. We don't want to touch them. We don't want to come into contact with them. We're here to observe from a distance only and let them be in their natural habitat. Okay, really important question. Uh, this is from Lawrence Intermedia in New Jersey. Who has the best food in the Arctic? Oh, I think we do. Um, we have really good uh, snacks. We have a really good chef. Um, I have yummy food when I'm up there. Um, I actually look forward to going for the food. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're very lucky that the UK research station has, has yummy food. Um, yeah, it's all good. Brilliant, fantastic. Uh, what do you do, for, this is Scarlett at Dover, uh, what do you do for shelter and food? So food, I've already said, we have um, a wonderful chef and a canteen that provide us with lots of hot meals. We take our own snacks like biscuits and nuts as well to keep us going. For shelter, we have cabins in the um, Arctic Research Station. So we've got, we're very lucky we've got hot water and we've got our own bunks, our own beds, um, and it's very, very comfortable and cosy. If you're going out uh, to do some research further afield, then you might take a tent or you might stay in a, in a cabin, which is a little bit more remote. Um, and then you're into a different level of uh, wilderness and cooking and stoves and all sorts of things. Brilliant. I'm just going to take a few. We've got some questions about the impact of, of, of COVID-19 on, on the um, on the Arctic and, and, and also sort of, you know, the, the, the community up there. But we have some questions also here. Um, Hi, Ellie. This is from Michael, Mike11. Hi, Ellie. What's the most interesting thing you've recently learned about the Arctic? Oh, um, the most interesting thing probably was, it's quite sad, but there was a paper published just a few days ago showing the highest ever number of microplastics found on the seabed. So again, this is confirming what scientists have thought for several um, years that uh, the ocean currents bring a lot of water north and then it deposits in the Arctic. So we're really seeing accumulation and that's kind of being proven now in the last in the last few days. Sad, um, but I mean, not there's, there's, there's a lot of that kind of story coming out of the Arctic, very sadly at the moment. Uh, we're just moving on. Amelia Ann would like to know how long have you done your job for? Uh, six years full time. I've been, t I did, before that I did seven years of teaching, which was a different type of science communication. I've been telling stories about science as long as I can remember. Brilliant. Um, the unknown would like to know, is r that really the Arctic behind you? This is really the Arctic behind me. I'm not there. This is a green screen, but this is a photo that I took um, from the uh, Arctic Research Station. So this is what you would be seeing if we were there. Um, this time last year. Brilliant. Uh, uh, this is a brilliant question. This just popped up on the live chat, and this is from uh, VQD, um, and that is, what does Swalbard mean and represent to you? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, it means and represents. It's, I would say, an opportunity to discover. I see it as an opportunity to, to discover more about the world and our impact on the world. And I see it as a beautiful escape 
from the everyday. It's unusual. It's a chance to sort of reset and s reset your view of the world and your perspective. So an opportunity to reset your perspective and uh, a chance to sort of discover and learn. Amazing. That's a good beautiful. question. Good, great question. Uh, we've got Marguerite at Dover College um, who would like to know, um, typically, um, because it will, the Arctic's on lockdown at the moment, but typically, um, how many people are at the sort of Neolosund, you know, science community and are, do they have roads um, like we do in the UK? So, uh, again, they, they don't have roads. There's tracks, sort of dirt tracks between each of the huts. Obviously, if you if you were watching the weather window, you'll see that six months of the year or probably about eight to ten months of the year, those are covered in snow. So you can sort of just ski between them um, when it's melted. They're sort of gravel mud roads, but there's no real there's no tarmac. There's no sidewalk or curbside or anything that you might be used to at home. Um, how many people? Well, in the UK research station, I think there's space for six to 12 people in terms of the bunks, the beds available. Um, and it just depends how many scientists you have at a time. So our team, actually, we sort of take over because there's maybe six or seven of us at, at one time, plus Nick Cox, who's the station manager, who you'll be speaking to on Wednesday. Um, so yeah, there might be maybe six, seven people in the base. It could hold a few more, but it's a small group. Brilliant. Um, very sadly, we, we've just got there's so many great questions. We do have uh, many more sessions coming over um, over this week, so we haven't managed to get yours. We've got an Arctic Q&A. I can't remember the time tomorrow. Um, I think, Ellie, that's with you and Clara um, who will be taking, taking that on. Um, but I just want to come down to these, these sort of timely questions, and I'm going to bundle them. Um, and these are from um, Ecuador. Um, so it's to do with the lockdown and, and first of all, whether there's anyone infected with COVID-19 on, on Svalbard and, and how you deal with someone who gets sick in a, in, a, in a remote community like this. Yeah, excellent question. And and part of the reason that we're not broadcasting live from Neolosund was obviously a safety decision to um, make sure that there's no burden on the people that are there, because if we were all to head there and one of us were to get sick, it's very difficult to get um, get back home and to get medical help in. There isn't anybody, uh, luckily, there's nobody currently infected. There's no outbreak, there's no infection, no symptoms in Svalbard, in uh, Neolosund, and it's all closed down and locked off. So we're hopeful and, and feeling positive that it's sort of ma managed and contained. If somebody were to get sick, either with COVID or if you know they slip and break a leg or they have you know any other health problem then there is a system in place to go and rescue those people but it's quite a a long system because it involves sort of emergency helicopters and skidoos and getting you to the hospital in Longyearbyen and then if needed getting you to Oslo so it's not like a quick 10 minute trip um, to the nearest uh, emergency room, it is a little bit tougher. And that's why everybody has to have very detailed medical certificates before they arrive to make sure there's no health problems. Um, and we have to be quite conscious of the weather as well, because if a big blizzard comes in for several weeks, then those emergency first aid um, helicopters wouldn't be able to rescue somebody. So there are times of year where you're quite cut off. And because of that, it's not uh, a risk that we can take sending people up at this time. And then the follow-on question from that is that we we hear a lot uh, in the news about the the sort of silver lining of the pandemic and lockdown is is the the the, the reduction in carbon emissions, the reduction in pollution, and the potential um, for you know for for natural systems to to have a chance to to rebound. So um, if if we stayed at home for a long, long time. Could global warming be reversed? And and, and how long might we, we sort of be expected to, before we saw um, any any positive sort of impact in Swalbard on, on, on sort of ice cover? 
Yeah, another good question. It's difficult to answer. There's definitely a positive impact on the environment of people staying home at the moment. We're not driving, we're not flying, manufacturing is, is decreased. So the sort of global carbon emissions are lower um, and we're definitely seeing an environmental improvement. Um, you can ask your teachers or your parents to Google what the current canals in Venice look like, uh, for example. Um, and uh, there's several stories stories that have come out about um, places that are sort of growing back, re uh, reefs that are recovering, things that are uh, seem to be responding really positively to not having human impact. Now, obviously, it'd be very easy for us to say as scientists and environmentalists, OK, brilliant, let's all stay at home for the next 10 years and let the world have a break and recover. Of course, that's not possible for a lot of people. It's very, very hard situation for a lot of people in lockdown, and we can't force people to continue um, in as extreme conditions as now. However, I think that this experience that we're all going through will hope i really hope that it teaches people that we can reduce our carbon footprint maybe not as extreme as it is now because we do need to do a little bit more movement but we should all be able to use this as a lesson to see how resilient the planet is and the fact that it can recover quite quickly so if we can sort of stay um keep some elements of the lockdown even afterwards that would be brilliant and i think that's something that it would be really exciting to see as scientists how, for example, the sea ice does recover um, the, the, the melting, for example, if the impact of COVID-19 is visible in, the, in those records, in the science records. Well, Ellie, Ellie, thank you so much for, for ending on that note of, of mindfulness during these very, very difficult times. And I mean that in sort of broadest sort of sense of the word, in so far as we can be we can see there being a rebounding of natural systems and of nature after we you know during this break um, that, that we're giving it and 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 that can give us hope and carrying on uh, that sense of, of of easing the burden that we're placing uh, on nature whatever course the sort of the, you know the lockdown or, or the economy or whatever it takes is is carrying carrying that lesson through from these difficult times ellie thank you so much uh for being part i say being part of back to arctic live you are part of back to arctic live sort of whether you're on screen or not but for, for 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 really sort of sharing your your thoughts your insights your views um and your experiences um with with our audiences it's been really fantastic to have you so thank you uh for everybody watching at home, um, thank you so much for being part of this broadcast. We have 18 more, I think even though we've 20 more broadcasts uh, over the next two weeks. We do have some French and German broadcast language broadcasts coming up next week as well. Um, so if those are your first languages, do, do tune in for those too. Um, but it's been fantastic to have you. You've sent so many questions through, and I really hope that we'll get to them at some point during these two weeks. Uh, tomorrow, do join us when we look more closely at the type of animals, type of life that we have up here in the Arctic. And also we've got an Arctic Q&A session, so keep those questions coming. But from now, it's goodbye from Virtual Neolicent. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been fantastic. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks everybody.